two. And we are now officially alive can you hear me? and well and kicking. We can hear you very clearly. <laughs> All the others are on mute, but uh, your microphone is still on, and so is your camera. We are very fortunate and privileged to have Dr. Carrie Corrigan, who is a rock specialist. Um, so, so essentially, you, you obviously are a geologist. You work, oh, we've lost her. Hopefully, she'll come back again. <laughs> she is a geologist, so she works with rocks. But in particular, I'm here. Um, Can you hear me? You're back again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, okay. so Carrie, all right, that was a bit of a struggle. <laughs> no problem. So, so Carrie is a geologist, and she works obviously with rocks, but in particular, she has a, 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 a let's say, an affection for for meteorites. So, before we do anything, um, I just want to clarify one thing: the difference between a meteorite, an asteroid, a comet, a meteor, a ball of cheese. What what are these things that everyone <laughs> talks about, and what is the difference? Well, that's a, that's a really good question and one of the places we always start when we do tours and things. So just a little bit about the words. So a meteorite is a rock from outer space. It could have come from an asteroid, from a planet, potentially from a comet, but it has made it to through the Earth's atmosphere and landed on the ground. So then you get break, broken down into an asteroid is a rock of a certain size floating around in space. Um, for the most part, they orbit the sun in you know, circular orbits between Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt. There are some that have different orbits because they've crashed into each other and gotten knocked out of their orbit. Some of those cross Earth orbit, and then that's how they get sucked into our gravity well and end up becoming a meteorite. Um, comets have, tend to have much bigger orbits that are more eccentric and go farther out and come closer in. Um, a meteoroid is a small asteroid. A meteor is only the part of the, the time frame when that meteoroid is passing through the Earth's atmosphere before it lands on the ground. So in space, it's a meteoroid. When it's a shooting star, it's a meteor. And when it lands on the ground, it's a meteorite. Never again to be called a meteor. <laughs> OK, so actually, so, so, so it really is a, a, a bit of semantics. I mean, it's it you is. are looking at the wording, but but Essentially, it's the same body, but it just takes on different forms, and when it lands, it is now called a meteorite. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now, before we get onto all the exciting bits, I want to go back a little bit. How did you get into what you are doing, and what is it exactly that you are doing uh, at the Smithsonian Institute? So how did I get into this? I ended up taking... I was a kid who was outdoors all the time, so I was always interested in science to some degree. And then I had a moment in when I went to college that I thought I would study English and art. And that lasted about one semester. I took an astronomy class. And I loved that class. And I, and I thought, oh, what's the next sort of logical class I could take? And these were undergraduate sort of general ed classes. And the professor recommended geology next. He said, you know, these are the aspects of the astronomy class you were really interested in. That was the planet. And so he said, take a geology class. And so I did. Yeah. And, and that went, wasn't your, your, I mean, it wasn't your first love. I mean, you weren't a, a rock person thinking, oh, I'd love to study. It was more of an afterthought. It really was, yeah. I mean, I, I liked rocks, and I played with them lots and played in the dirt and all those kinds of things and fossils when I was little. But I didn't, I didn't ever, I was never exposed to the idea that it could be a career, I guess, is really how I would put it. And then I thought, well, I love these classes. The least I'm going to do is get myself through college with a degree that I enjoy, and we'll worry about getting jobs later. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I took the geology class, and I went to those professors and said, okay, these are two of the best classes I've taken in college. You know, is there a way to combine them? And they said, well, there's this thing called planetary geology. And I just thought, okay, well, what are going to be the jobs there? But okay, let's, let's try this. So I had an internship, and the intern, well, I had a professor who I, when I went to the geology department, said, this is what I want to declare as my major. I'm kind of interested in this planetary geology thing. The guy who had randomly been in the office when I went to declare my major, she said, you know, can you be her advisor? He said, sure, come with me. He said, I happen to be the only person in this university who does anything remotely close to what you're interested in, and I study meteorites. And he said, it's not even my main thing. I do it as an offshoot. So I, I spent the next four years studying geology as a, just a, you know, general degree. And then I didn't, my last year I did a research project with him. And then I ended up getting an internship at Johnson Space Center. 
And then from that, during that summer, I met my, who would become my graduate advisor and the guy who became my postdoc advisor, so the job I got after my PhD, and actually he's my boss now. So that's kind of how I got there. I never thought really that people studied meteorites for a living until I met any of these people. And then what I do here is I study meteorites pretty much all day. So I'm the curator of the Antarctic Meteorite Collection, and so half of my job is based on actually taking care of the meteorites that the U.S. program brings back from Antarctica every year. And this is the 40th season of collecting meteorites in Antarctica coming up um, in what will be the Southern Hemisphere summer. So you're going into winter now, right? So we mm -hmm. come down there in November-ish um, and start for the summer. And then they've collected 23,000 meteorites in these 39 years so far. So my job is to figure out what kind of meteorites they are, to take care of them here, um, and to give them out to researchers all across the world when they want to do studies on research, on meteorites. But now, I'm, I'm, okay, so, so let's, let's look at it from a logic point of view. Yeah. A stone <laughs> comes flying all the way through Earth's atmosphere, burns up a little bit, some parts of it break up, and they land on Earth. How on earth do you know that that is a meteorite? It's just a stone. No, nope, that's lying a lying there. Question. <laughs> and how do you know to look there? Obviously, if someone says, "I saw a bright light," people get excited, and I know that there are TV programs of of um, meteorite uh, hunters, and they go running around looking because I think there's some money involved. Yeah. So, like, how would you know to go and look at that specific spot for a meteorite? And you get coffee in the middle. I love I it. I get coffee. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> so um, that's that's a hugely good question, right? So if people out there are trying to find meteorites, the best places to go in the world to find meteorites are deserts, partly because water is the enemy. So if you know rain and snow and things will uh, will break down meteorites just like they will any other rocks. And I happen to have a bag of meteorites that I, these are 10 Antarctic meteorites that I just got sent on Friday. I'm going to open one of these. How do you know that there are 10, I mean, someone in Antarctica could be sitting there going, watch this, this is going to be such a fun thing. I'm going to send a whole batch of stones and put some labels on. How would you know that they are the real thing? So the people who have gone there in, and done the six, so they spent six weeks in the field collecting these. And so we are all, and they're all people who volunteer from the meteorite community. So it's all the same people. Two or three of the same people are always there. Um, and they kind of guide everybody. But this is, so this is a little meteorite. Can you see this? Uh, this is a little look. chip from a meteorite that show up. Uh -huh. And can and you see that? like volcanic rock. It does. But can you see that black crust on the outside? Can you see the difference between them? If I give it a shadow, you might yep, be able to see. Yep, I can see. That is what we call fusion crust. And that fusion crust is what forms when it's passing through the Earth's atmosphere. So when it's a meteor, uh -huh. it's burning up and melting the very outer portion of that. And so we can look at the rocks on the ground in Antarctica or in the Sahara or southwestern U.S. deserts and say, okay, that could be a meteorite because it's got that crust on it. Aha, uh -huh. so then that's, that's the one do. clue that yeah. obviously a rock that comes flying in will burn up a little bit around the sides and, and that would give you an indication. Okay, so that I get. Yeah. So now, how do you know that a piece of rock comes from Mars? That's another really good question. So this one, I can almost definitely tell you is a piece of an asteroid just based on how it looks. Um, it's not... 90% of the meteorites kind of are, are the same thing. And they're asteroidal. They're primitive. They haven't been altered since they were they came together as an asteroid four and a half billion years ago. And that's 90% of what we have. So the 10% that look different, we can pretty much tell. For the most part, we can tell right away. Um, and so those are the ones we get really excited about because those are rocks that have experienced geologic processing. So melting or impact or alteration from water on its asteroid or heating up in some way or just some kind of geologic process. So the Martian ones look just like, like you said, some of them look just like basalts, look just like basalts or igneous rocks from Earth. And we had a group of these meteorites for a long time that people didn't know or have the capability of saying, we knew they were 
we knew they were young because people have been able to date them, and we knew they were from volcanoes. So they had to say, like, where in the solar system have there been volcanoes that recently? So, like I said, this is probably four and a half billion years old. Those meteorites are probably 300 million to a billion at the most. And so they're like, we there's are way younger geologically, right? So not four and a half billion, but less than one million. And so they said, these are young. These must come from somewhere that have has had volcanism, and that volcanism has happened fairly recently geologically. And then it wasn't until, but they kept saying, no, we can't have these from Mars because we don't have anything from the moon at the time. This was the early 80s. And we don't have um, a way that we think we can get rocks off of other planets without actually hitting them so hard that they would be destroyed. You know, can you get a rock out of the gravity of Mars without hitting it so hard that you would destroy it? And they basically said no. And then all kind of within the same couple year period, uh, Vi the Viking landers had gone to Mars and measured the atmosphere composition, so the composition of the Martian atmosphere. And then some guys at Johnson Space Center, NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, actually were able to find some rock that had melted in one of the meteorites. And they heated up that melted rock because when it melted, it then trapped some of it cooled very very quickly and when it cooled very quickly it trapped some of the gas from the atmosphere of the planet that it came from so they were able to heat up that piece of melted rock and release that gas back out and measure the composition of it and then compared it with the Viking lander composition of the Martian atmosphere and it's a, basically a one-to-one -one match in the noble gases in nitrogen and carbon dioxide I'm totally now different Earth's atmosphere. That must have been one of the most exciting things for you to discover, that it actually was a match. I mean, it's, it's a bit yeah. of detective work, really. Oh, yeah, hugely detective work. And it's just not only that, so they're putting together a mission that had been there in Mars five years ago. These rocks that have been sitting around in people's drawers for decades, you know, finding this tiny little piece of melted rock in there. And then also... Um, the lunar, first lunar meteorite was brought back from our Antarctic program almost at the same time. So the argument that, well, we should have tons of rocks on the Earth's surface from the moon, right? Look at the moon. It's been beaten up mm -hmm. for centuries and you know, for millions of years. And if, that has, if that's the case and we can get rocks off of a planet, then we should have tons from the moon. Well, then, like the next year, the first lunar meteorite was discovered in the Antarctic collection. And so they had to change all of their thinking about whether you can actually get a rock off of another planet, because look, we can. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now we measure the oxygen isotopes, so the different weights of oxygen, 16, 17, and 18. We measure those in the minerals inside of the meteorites, and we take a ratio of the 17 to the 16, 17 to the 18, and the signature of that oxygen 17 is different for every sort of planetary body in the solar system. So the Earth and the Moon are different from Mars. They're different from certain kinds of asteroids. So now we, if we think we have a Martian meteorite, we'll measure its oxygen instead of going through the painstaking, you know, finding a piece of melt and releasing those gases. It's much easier to just measure the oxygen isotopes. And okay. if they match the Martian group, then we can tell awesome. from Mars. Now, I've, I've got yeah. lots of questions, but I want to give, uh, <laughs> Joe, maybe your class has a question. Or possibly I see, Jen? I can see one from Jen. Can you see that one that's up there? About yeah, I, I did see that, so I, I, okay. I, want, I want the kids to actually ask them your, themselves okay. if they're not too shy. So do any of you want to ask a question to, to Carrie? Yeah, I'd love to hear from you. He's just asking around, and Jen, anyone in your group? <laughs> yeah, come ask, Isaac. Okay. Uh, come over here. Um, so I'd like to preface the question with this is an 8th grader, and we have 10 okay. days of school left. Okay. I'll go fast. <laughs> All right. Oh, no, no. I'm just, you know, 8th grader with 10 days left. He's, you know. <laughs> no. Okay. Why does this matter? Like, what, what does this job do for us? Like, for that, like that's it. Okay, that's like the question of my entire existence, right? <laughs> you just called me out on why does my job matter. <laughs> so, the, But it's a hugely good question because the – the understanding how the solar system forms helps us learn how Earth formed. And if we don't know how the Earth formed, then we can't even get to begin to the question about where life came from on Earth. So 
we're looking at meteorites that are actually the same composition as the bulk composition of the Earth. Some of the types of meteorites that we have. And they're also the, the same ones are bulk composition of the Sun. And so we're actually looking at starting material for the whole solar system and the starting material for Earth and all life on Earth. And in some of these meteorites they're finding amino acids and they're finding um, other proteins and things that aren't left over from dead things, but they're actually the beginnings of the chains of the building blocks of life. And finding these in the meteorites, which means that we that Earth started out with these sort of pre-organic materials before, before it evolved into having plants and single-celled things and, and even probably liquid water, which was probably the key to making these thrive. But well, I'm not a biologist. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to throw a tough one at you. We have yeah. got astronauts who are building up to go and visit Mars and as you know you are involved in the Humans to Mars Summit which is coming up uh, from the 17th to the 19th of May yeah. and what what obviously everyone's talking about going to Mars and how we're going to get there and the difficulty and what we're going to find it's no news for you you've you've got a piece of it and you've you've known about it for a long time so you actually don't have to go to the planet to find a piece to analyze, I mean, you've actually got the piece. So is there the information that you now have that you can share with the astronauts so when they get there, they don't have to reinvent the bagel? Absolutely. So we can tell them, point them in the direction. If they're looking for signs of life, they need to be looking in areas where there was liquid water. That would be our first place, our first guess as to where to go to find habitable environments or formerly habitable environments. So they need to be able to recognize the minerals in the rocks around them that needed water to form. So things like carbonates, um, and I don't know if you seen, remember I've seen the pictures of the Martian blueberries, their hematite, those minerals that needed water to form. And those are the places that they're going to start. They're going to look for clay minerals, which are, they tend to be the byproduct of water breaking down rocks into smaller and smaller things. Um, but yeah, and, and to try and see the signatures of, you know, there probably isn't liquid water on the surface now, but can you tell where it would have been? And then you what can start about, <laughs> What about the chance of actually finding life within a meteorite? So far we haven't been able to do it, but if you think about the fact that meteorites go up into space, right, once they're launched off the planet, they are, and they've been on Mars for a long time, and they're probably on the surface of Mars, the surface of there's no atmosphere, there's a very thin, tenuous atmosphere left on Mars, and so they've been being bombarded by cosmic rays, really unfriendly environment. We think the meteorites that we have were on the surface, then they were launched into space where it's, you know, ridiculously cold temperatures, and then they're, they travel out there for a really long time, they're bombarded by even more cosmic rays, and they end up you know, passing through the Earth's atmosphere, going through this really rough entry, just like you see the space shuttle come back in, or the Apollo capsules, if you've ever seen the videos of those, you know, flames coming off of them. And then they land on Earth, and who knows what they encounter until you pick them up. If they're in Antarctica, then they're frozen, which is why we love to go there, because if you're looking for organics, no, the, the frozen conditions in Antarctica basically keep the rock and any kind of organics on Earth from interacting. Um... Yeah, so I think if we're going to find anything on Mars, it's probably going to be in the subsurface. People think that most likely, if there's liquid water, it's below the surface. And so they're probably going to have to dig to find any, if they're going to find any kind of signs of life. Okay. Now, I know Fran had a question. So yes. where's Franny? Would you like to ask your question? Hey, can you hear us all right? We can hear you clearly. Excellent. Go ahead. Uh, I was wondering um, if you had any other interests besides science and geology, and I mean, I know they go pair to pair, but uh, any interests besides those? You mean like in my life, like hobbies and things, or I have three kids, so those take up most <laughs> of my time. <laughs> but um, we do we do a lot of outdoor stuff. We do a lot of my kids are. Of course, parents of you know, my husband is also a scientist, so the, our kids tend to go toward art and anything that doesn't have anything to do with science. 
So we do a lot of exploring that kind of thing. We love, um, we like to go to plays and concerts. We like a lot of music. Um, and my daughter is really into animals and art. So we do, well, let's see, have you heard of the Wild Kratts? We recently went and saw the Wild Kratts live. <laughs> but I do a lot of, the, that one I might not have been my choice, but they loved it. Um, but yeah, I live, I work right next to out my window is the National Gallery of Art. So it's the building next door. I, we spend a lot of our lunch times wandering around and looking at the paintings and the sculptures in there, just because it's kind of a completely different thing, and it kind of helps reset your brain in a different way. And I think the outside perspective on that, and just to remember that, you know, there's a whole world out there besides looking at rocks like I do every day, right? People do all kinds of other things, especially in Washington, D.C., so it's a good place to be for that. But now, if, if, if I look at you from a science and, and an academic point of view, uh, you are in quite an enviable position because who else has got Martian rocks in their possession? Yeah, not, not too many people. Um, three or four other museums in the world and six or seven universities probably have pieces. There are lots of meteorite collectors, but the thing with collecting is that you know you put it on a shelf and nobody gets to study it unless you've given a piece of it to a university. So that's one thing about meteorites is they have names. And if you were to find a meteorite in your yard, uh, it would be named for it, the, the closest post office to you. And if you live out in the wow. middle of nowhere, it would be named for the closest sort of like mountain or river or something. Ah, yeah, so a meteorite recently fell in a suburb of Washington, D.C. called Lorton. And so that meteorite is called Lorton, Virginia. And to get an official name, there's actually a whole committee of people who do this. They, they, they verify and, and give meteorites names. And a meteorite isn't official, and we can't do research and publish on it without its official name. So, and to be, get an official name, you have to give a piece of that meteorite to a legitimate scientific institution. So either a museum or a university or some place where you know people are doing research and that it will be made available to other people to do research on. But now wait a second. If a <laughs> meteorite comes from another planet, then surely there must be some value to it. So now obviously it's difficult to quantify a value, right. but that would mean that if I was a meteorite hunter and I was searching for these things, I could generate an income out of this. Right. And your your meteorite does get more legitimate in terms of cost if it's official, if it's got an official name. So they do tend to partner with people from in research institutions to get their meteorite classified to so figure out what kind it is and then to get it a name so that it, it's recognizable in the in the world of dealers and collectors and and things. But yeah, you can you can do that. I mean, if you've ever heard of Christie's, right, the auction house, they either just did or are about to do a really big one in London. There are a lot of meteorites on that list of things that are being wow. auctioned on. And, and you know, as far as valuing things, all you can really say is it's worth whatever someone will pay for it. That's true. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it is a stone, but it's, <laughs> but it's a unique stone. It's a collector's Sometimes, item. Yeah, some of these things on Christie's, their minimum bids, for example, were in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow, and if I convert yeah. that to rands, it's, it's insane. But now, yeah. let's, let's just ask, a couple houses worth. I, I, I need to know the truth here, and this is, you have to be absolutely honest. Have you ever found kryptonite? I have krypton in the, in the meteorite. The element krypton is in is there. Um, okay, but, you see, yeah, so there is some truth to it. Rock. Yeah. <laughs> and is it bright <laughs> glowing <laughs> green? It's one of the elements they used to figure out that the Martian meteorites were from Mars. That's one of the noble gases that they used. I've never found solid kryptonite. <laughs> Just well, the gas. There's where the money lies. Mm -hmm. Maybe according to Lex Luthor. So now the, the other thing I want to... <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so, so now obviously meteorites, they, they don't come in one size fits all. They come in all sizes. What is the largest meteorite that we, we've actually had on Earth? So the one that's in Namibia, whose name I'm going to completely blank on right now, but it's in Namibia. So you're in South Africa, yeah? We are pretty close. In fact, I'm going to Namibia later on this year. There Where should I go and visit? It is in the desert, and it's, it's, it was such a big iron meteorite that they couldn't move it out of the ground. 
it's still there, sitting in the hole that it formed. I'm going to make a note of that right yeah. now as we speak. Yeah, and I should and look does up. Does it have a name? Do they just call it Namibia because it's so big they had to name the nearest country. No, and as of course I'm drawing a blank on the name. Um, I'll think of it though. If I stop thinking about it, I'll think of it. <laughs> But, I mean, obviously, they've had a couple in Egypt, and they've had, in fact, you've had yep. meteorites all over the world. What are, how big are some of these meteorites? So the biggest ones I've said that we've found in Antarctica are probably, there's one, the biggest one is probably, big, a big one each season is maybe, once a season we'll find a bowling ball-sized meteorite. And that's okay, big. well, maybe I can share a photo, and, and people could, maybe you could talk to the photo. Let's see if sure. it will load up. You're going to show me one that's tiny? Oh, yeah. So the one on the top, um, so I have my two hands there, right? I have in my left hand, so the one on the top, that meteorite is Nakla. It fell in Egypt, and that is a Martian meteorite. And the one below it, I believe, is called Stannern, which we know comes from the asteroid Vesta. Mm -hmm. The sort of squarish one just below my hands is another piece of Mars. That one fell in Namibia. And... No, no, sorry, Nigeria. And the one to the left of the photo, the leftmost meteorite, is one that fell in Sylacauga, Alabama, and that's the only one we've ever known to hit anybody. It hit a woman oh. while she was taking her nap. And it went through her roof and through her the ceiling of the second floor and then bounced off a piece of furniture and hit her while she was having a nap. And then the flat one, that's the one where they're finding things like amino acids, and that's called a carbonaceous chondrite. And that is, is the one with the amino acids and the pre-solar grains and sort of the same bulk composition of the Earth. And if you look behind me, all the way over on the right, you can see just uh, below there's sort of a horizontal picture that just goes mm -hmm. off, the, off the screen. Um, that meteorite right there that you have the arrow on, that is the Old Woman Mountains meteorite, and that's the biggest yep. meteorite we have in our collections. Yep, that is that is propped up on the floor behind me over there. So that gives you an idea of how tall that is. And that's now, do you, do you have to cut them and to extract them, or do you just... Uh, I mean, obviously you want to take the whole piece if you can, but if you can't, do you just take a sample piece, and how big should it be that, that you want to take it with you? Right, so that meteorite, actually, the military got involved, and they had to take that out of the mountains. The Old Woman Mountains is a range in California that is um, kind of in the eastern, southern portion of the state, and so it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty rural. Um, they, the military actually went, in, or the National Guard, I think it was, went and got that with a helicopter. They had to have a helicopter to lift that out of there. And it got brought here to the museum and sliced. We have a, a room-sized wire saw so that can cut huge meteorites like that. And it's wow. the, the blade of the saw kind of goes around like this on pulleys. And so, but that's, you know, twice as tall as I am. So maybe like 10 feet off the ground-ish on this giant, giant saw. And then it would be up on a platform, the meteorite itself. And it moves along as those wires just continually go around and round and cut through it. And it takes, I think they said it took them about a week to cut that meteorite. Because wow. it was that big. So you've got but some cool smaller, toys to play with. Smaller meteorites. <laughs> and, and I mean, obviously if you've got large ones like that, what happens when a large one hits the Earth? Surely that could affect possibly the dinosaurs maybe? Yeah, yep. And that one, we don't even, we have, people estimate that that one was kilometers across. And the, the one in Namibia, it fell and it made a big hole, but, and you can see how big it is when you go. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. It is still sitting in that hole. And so that kind of gives you an idea of how big and what damage it would do. Um, the Allende meteorite, the one I showed you the slice in that picture, mm -hmm. that one was a 2.2 ton is, is how much of it we recovered. So that was a really big body coming in. To the into the atmosphere, but it broke up in the atmosphere, and so just lots of smaller pieces rained down. And so the biggest one is you know, probably bowling ball size. And then the one that fell in Russia, what three years ago, um, that one broke up in the atmosphere also. 
so thankfully. And they said that was probably the size of a VW bus or something on its way in. But that was spectacular. I mean, people with the, the, the car cameras were mm -hmm. filming it, and obviously with cell phones, and you got yeah. to see the most incredible light show, and the fact that it never really landed in a populated area is yeah. a complete miracle. That nobody, that nobody was, you know, people were injured by the breaking glass from the shock wave, I think, and, and knocked to the ground, but nobody was hit by any of it, and yeah, it was a miracle that no one was hurt. But they do, wow. you think the 70% of the Earth is water, right? So 70% of the meteorites probably land in the oceans. And no place, there was the question, there was no place on Earth that we know of gets more than others. But, you know, places that are not populated probably, you know, no one would ever know there was one that fell there. Well, we I mean, found I, meteorites in Greenland, and lots in Antarctica. Uh -huh. Yeah, lots. Um, many up in Canada, especially if they fall during the winter, they land on the snow and people see them. And in Antarctica, the, for the most part, they're sitting on the ice because the ice moves and the meteorites that may have gotten buried in that ice get resurfaced. So wow. they end up being brought to the surface and then they're... On, in icy areas where that ice is stuck and can't go anywhere, so the meteorites just kind of hang out until someone comes and picks them up. It's between sure. so the the Japanese and the Chinese and the South Koreans and the U.S. and there's been one European um, trip that have gone to collect meteorites. And between everybody, I would say we have bordering on sixty or seventy thousand meteorites from Antarctica, which is wow. pretty exciting. Yeah. But now. Okay, here's the big issue. No uh, end we, in <laughs> we, we know that meteorites tend to, well, they're not meteorites when they are zooming past Earth. Mm -hmm. And then we get these little messages to say, don't worry, it's, 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 very, it's, it's a flyby, it's very close. But in space terms, it's only about 400,000 kilometers away from Earth. But don't yeah. stress, it's not going to cause any damage. And then all of a sudden, you're sitting in your porch, and then... <laughs> This meteor comes and they go. Well, we didn't. We didn't know about that one. It it came yeah. out of nowhere. You're right. So so do we actually know about these things, or or are they going to continuously surprise us? I think so. There is a program before everybody freaks out. There is a funded program. It's called the Near Earth Object. You know, they're trying to find as many as we can. Neo Wise, it's called, and they have. They think that they started with a certain size. Right, and they think they've found 90% of the asteroids out there of a certain size that are Earth-crossing orbits, so that could actually intersect with us. Um, and then they've gone down to the next size, and they've got you know 75%. They think of those, and then the next smaller size, and they'll go down to the size that they think are worth, you know, you know, planetary annihilation down to you know local. It could just hurt and affect a city. Just for kill example. three people, just, four people, just, yeah, that's no. something. <laughs> it's, a hard way to look at. it's a hard way to look at, but you have to start somewhere, right? The, the biggest problem that we have is that giant glowing ball of gas right in the sky. So that blocks our view of a lot of meteorites. If you're at Earth, you know, on Earth trying to see these, then you need to make sure that the sun's light isn't blocking your view. So there is, there is a talk of having a spacecraft go toward the sun and turn around and look facing back out to Earth to be the next step of this so that they'd be looking away from the sun and be able to see more material that's that's potentially either on the inside of Earth or just the smaller stuff. But what about radio telescopes? Surely those would be more effective than actual telescopes? And as you know, in South Africa we have the SKA, which is going to go on, on online and, and hopefully reveal much more information than we've known before. Right, and on, on Friday I went and had a tour of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is sort of the next mm -hmm. generation Hubble that's going to be launched in a couple of years. It's actually being, it's pretty much put together. It's pretty pretty awesome. And so the same thing, yeah, those these telescopes, every time we put more up there, we'll get more and more information to fill in this puzzle. So hopefully, wow. hopefully, yeah. And there's an, an, a mission called the Asteroid Redirect Mission. I don't know if you've heard about this, where they're, talking about going to an asteroid in the asteroid belt, a near, or probably a near-Earth asteroid, getting a huge boulder off of it, bringing it back, and putting it into orbit around the moon. So, well, if I haven't anything, heard about that. I've heard moon. of Osiris Rex, but I haven't heard about that. 
Yeah, well, and it's possible they'll go to that same asteroid if the Osiris, if Bennu turns out to be a great asteroid with big boulders that they could go grab. We know how to get to Bennu pretty easily once they've done it once, right? So they've got all those calculations done. But they'll go to, so it's one of the candidates for this, is to go get an asteroid from there, bring it back, put it in orbit around the moon, and then asteroid, astronauts will go there into lunar orbit and crawl around on it and bring samples back. And so those would be samples from an asteroid that haven't passed through the Earth's atmosphere. So we can actually see if there's a difference between the ones that have passed through and the ones that haven't. Why not just crash it on the moon and then just collect it from there? I Well, I think so. That's that's a good question. But the other thing is that then you've impacted it, right? And that could affect it. You've also covered it in moon dirt because there's all the melted, you know, all the regolith on the moon. But they're and actually cheese. practicing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cheese. They're practicing, <laughs> practicing, you know, astronaut techniques of being able to sample things on airless bodies, you know, low gravity airless bodies. But they're also, this mission is is practicing and trying to understand the composition of asteroids and what it would take to you know, lock a spacecraft onto an asteroid and fire its engines to redo the orbit of that asteroid, for example, so that it wouldn't hit Earth. If you just nudge it enough so that it wouldn't hit Earth if it was on its way to us. So it's part of this near-Earth asteroid you know, planetary protection plan. Very, very cool. Well, I mean, when you say planetary it sounds like protection science plan, fiction. no, not at all. It's science fact because if a meteor does come towards us, right. and before it becomes a meteorite, I mean, there'd be movies about maybe even uh, blasting it uh, or perhaps trying to steer it in a different direction. And I see that Mr. McNulty's class has to go, so we'll just hey, say goodbye to Mr. McNulty's class. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. <laughs> So, so I mean, are those options real? I mean, that's a yeah. serious threat. Yeah, well, and it's a ser serious attention to an actual threat, right? I mean, we're in the point where society has the capability to actually do something about itself being annihilated like the dinosaurs were, which is mind-blowing, too. Uh -huh. you know, we can actually alter the course of what could potentially have been Earth's demise and keep it from happening, or at least civilization's demise. Sure. And, I mean, you, this, this Human to Mars Summit is, is, is going to be quite an exciting opportunity to start talking about uh, the eventual landing on Mars, bringing samples back. Of course, Elon Musk doesn't believe in time frames, and he wants to get there <laughs> about yes, 12 right. years before NASA. But, yeah. And yet, he will. <laughs> you know, South Africans, they are a little bit crazy. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I find fascinating though is that you've obviously had these Martian rocks. What do you know that no one knew before? Is there something top secret that we need to know about these rocks or are they just, I mean they're nice because they come from Mars but they're just regular space rocks or is there something special about them? Ooh, well, other than just the emotional part of it, right? <laughs> the fact uh -huh. that they're from Mars, which is just mind-blowing itself. I think in terms of the minerals and the elements that are in these meteorites, they're all the same minerals and elements, you know, the elements that make up the minerals and the minerals that make up the rocks that we see on Earth. And we can use the same techniques we use to study Earth rocks to figure out, you know, how much oxygen was in the magma that formed these later erupted basalts. And we can understand... Some of these rocks we know if they formed below the surface. They weren't surface basalts like you see on a volcano in Hawaii. They would have been um, scientifically different, more like studying subsurface igneous rocks. So we can understand the subsurface of Mars that way. But in terms of the life, I think the, th the thing we have in our meteorite hands are these minerals that we know form from liquid water, so we know it had to have been there. And that's, that's going to, again, be the biggest clue that there may have been. Without water, I don't know if we would even have a clue where to start looking. <laughs> well, well, what is interesting is that tomorrow night I'm going to be interviewing uh, Penny Boston. And okay. uh, do you know Penny at all? No, I know the name, okay, so, but I don't know her. So, so Penny does something quite unique. She is a speleologist, and yeah. she loves going into caves, but yeah. not just any caves. 
inhospitable caves. The ones yeah. where there's sulfuric acid and, 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 and poison fumes. Because if we're going to go to another planet, the chances are that if we're looking, and, and obviously she looks for life forms in those very harsh environments, yeah. the ch chances are that if we land on Mars and we find a cave, she'll know what the key signs are and what to look for when it comes to life, just as you would know when it comes to which rock samples and, and that type of thing to, to go for. Yeah, and I think the whole field, I mean, we would call her kind of an astrobiologist or a geomicrobiologist or... Um, so she, that whole sort of field really, really flourished with lots of funding to do the research after this Allen Hills 84001, the Martian meteorite that was found with the carbonates in it. You know, after we got that and people thought maybe signs of life in it, probably not now, but but those minerals that were water formed, and then we had to ask ourselves, we have no idea what life would actually look like if we did it. You know, we might not even recognize it. So this yeah. whole astrobiology program flourished in a huge way of people studying all these great extreme environments and inhospitable places for people to, you know, go in and find things that can survive in super, super low temperatures, super, super high temperatures, crazy sulfuric acid, you know, those methane environments and all kinds of stuff. So it's, wow. it's a really exciting field that's really, in the last probably 15 years, really taken off. I think really all these fields are so exciting. I mean, yeah. if, if I can uh, lay, lay put, put your fears or your, your concerns uh, to rest, I mean, look at the chief NASA scientist. Ellen Stofan is, is a geologist. So, so there we go. I mean, there's always hope. Because yeah. I think that, that all aspects of, you know, looking at planets and, and where we come from and where we're going, I think that all those aspects are particularly interesting. But even now, things are changing at such a dramatic pace with yeah. technology and what we're going to be able to do. Your analysis methods are going to improve. The yeah. ability to get samples and bring them back is going to be something that you never had before. Right. The ability to, to now locate or even have an app they can pick up when there's a movement in the sky, and then you can send citizen scientists to go and find that meteorite. Yep. I mean, this is it's insane how things are changing. Exciting, yeah. Yeah, so and then I agree. And things like um, I don't know, nanometer sized particles that we can now measure the composition of just that individual nanometer sized mineral and find out that it's actually from a star that that died before our solar system formed. You know, these pre-solar grains they're finding in meteorites now are just, you know, that technology really only came into play in the last 15 years. We didn't have nano-SIMS instruments to measure this stuff. And so every time the technology gets better, there's a whole, you know, a whole world of level of detail we can uncover, which is just, it's hard to keep up with it mentally. <laughs> what about radioactive rock that comes and lands on our planet? Um, so the radioactive decay, I mean, they have plenty of it here. And a lot of the really radioactive hot things, those have really short half-lives. And so things that, that we think like iron-60 and aluminum-26, these elements that existed at the very beginning of the solar system and burned out really hot and contributed to the melting of asteroids, those have all burned out their half-life. So they're all, a lot of those are gone. Um, and I don't. So far, we haven't found anything that's going to cause any radioactive levels beyond anything we find on Earth. So, so far, we well, think we're safe from that. <laughs> no glowing, smoking thing. <laughs> One of the students that I teach, um, she said to me this morning, "You know, okay, so you're interviewing this this uh, meteorite woman, and that's wonderful. But you know, how much can you tell from a rock?" And I said, "Well, you know, it's interesting. If we find a person's tooth." We can tell quite a lot about that person, whether they yeah. ate meat yeah. or were vegetarian, male or female, uh, how old they were, which state. So we could actually tell a lot of very interesting things just from a tooth. Right. And a rock is probably in the same sort of situation yeah. where it feeds yeah. information from what you discover around it and inside it and, and, the, and the various components that make up that rock. You could obviously yeah. learn a lot about that particular planet's surface. Absolutely, and, and one of the things that we have a struggle with is that we have rocks that just get delivered to us, you know, like here's a piece of Mars, throw it at us, but they, we don't know uh -huh. where on Mars it came from. So that's one of the problems that we have is context. 
and to be able to go to Mars and bring samples back where we know exactly on the surface what where they came from, what the surrounding environment was like, you know, what was it a dusty environment, was it a rubble pile, was it part of an actual outcrop of clearly that was clearly a lava flow or is it from material that got washed in from a gully during you know some kind of flood or from a river bed or lake bed or any of these kinds of things the context makes a huge difference in the story that you would tell whereas we for the moon especially you know the lunar rocks from Apollo we know where they came from but the meteorites we think are random so we think we actually have samples from different places on the surface than just these Apollo rocks which actually it turns out we think the Apollo rocks are kind of strange and unique in terms of the whole geologic surface of the moon. <laughs> They're very wow. specific and many of them are, they all come from these impacts into that place where those big mare oceans are that you see on the near side. Or if you look on the far side there really aren't these big oceans like that. And so our hope is to be able to someday get samples from the, the far side of the moon that would be totally different and not maybe not affected by these giant impacts as much. Do you or, have any rocks from anything besides Mars or the Moon? We have Something Mars, of, the Moon, and Vesta that we Vesta. know of. Vesta. Yeah. And nothing That's from Jupiter, from Saturn? Nope. Definitely that, not Jupiter from Pluto. <laughs> yeah, <and> probably not. <laughs> so Jupiter and Saturn probably have too thick of atmospheres, and the things would burn up on the way in and never make it out. The same with Venus. We think that Venus's atmosphere is too thick and, you know, it was, something would burn up on the way in more than it would burn up on the way in, even on the way into Earth, and then to land and then to get through that atmosphere, the friction of getting back out through that atmosphere would be really difficult. Plus, you've got the gravity of the planet and you've got its proximity to the sun, so it may go toward the sun as opposed to being sent toward Earth, but we don't know. And Mercury, wow. Mercury, there's lots of arguments about whether any of our meteorites are from Mercury, but we think we have things that are similar to the surface of Mercury, but we, Mercury, but we don't think they actually came from there. But now, if you found Probably, a piece of Mercury, would that be more exciting than Mars? It would be different. <laughs> yeah, so it would, <laughs> because it would be a new thing, right? Every time it's something totally new that you can confirm, that's ridiculously exciting. Would it be one of those, um, you know, how certain cell phone companies, I won't mention any names because some fruit might come to mind, where <laughs> they do a big launch of a new product, would it be one of these unveilings of a piece of stone that it comes from Mercury? I mean, it yeah, would be yeah. a big deal. It would be press conferencey, I think. <laughs> oh, okay, so it would be news Yeah, very cool. <laughs> so now Kyle wants to know, um, have any old meteorites been found uh, actually stuck inside glaciers? Yeah, definitely. And there have been meteorites, so the, all of the Antarctic ones are meteorites that were found in glaciers, but the glaciers erode away. And they, as the glacier, glaciers, some of, in Antarctica sometimes they sublime, so they go from solid ice to gas. They don't necessarily melt in between. And that's just because it's so dry there and so cold. So when that ice gets eroded or ablated away, then your meteorites are just left sitting on the surface. And those are the kind we love because they have they have been frozen and nothing is nothing is interacted with those so in something like a glacier in a mountain range you know on in Europe or North America or whatever that those would be wet glaciers so they might not be quite as ideal but uh, and I know in Greenland they've found meteorites that have come out of glaciers and are from Greenland they've been to Iceland and looked but there was something called so the Antarctic Search for Meteorite program is called ANSMET, so they did one called GreensMET, so Greenland Search for Meteorites, and they didn't find anything, not even one. And they think it gets just enough warmer there that the meteorites themselves from the sun get heated up on the surface and melt the ice just below them to the point where they sink into the ice. So they found places where the texture of the ice was slightly different, it may be smoother like it had been melted and, and then you know, re-solidified but to the point where the meteorites went down where they couldn't see those. They went to the same types of environments, the blue ice regions where the ice is stuck up against the mountains underneath, where they expected they would find them, and just didn't. So, so in you, don't, you, you don't walk around with a metal detector looking for these things, or do you? I mean, what, what sort of uh, device would you use to try and identify 
a, in, a meteorite. In Antarctica? In Antarctica, yeah, anyway. we use our eyes in Antarctica because it's a black rock sitting on a white surface, and, and we know the regions that they should be, and you, your eye is really amazingly good at telling the difference between the local rocks that are brown and the difference in the fusion crust on the outside. It's, it's interesting, though, because that fusion crust tends to look a lot like what we call desert varnish, which is a wind, kind of a coating that gets put on rocks in, in the desert because of the wind and particles sort of smoothing them off. Um, but your eye gets pretty good at telling. Every year, we you know, four or five non-meteorites come back in the group of three or 300. They usually collect somewhere between 300 and 1,000 meteorites every season. There's usually four or five earth rocks in there. But and you, they have taken a, a, a metal detector once to Antarctica, but for the most part, those help you find meteorites that are the 90%, and you don't. You know, we already got plenty of those, so they don't really help you find anything unique. And so they're and they're kind of. They said they was kind of a pain because it was really so cold. The thing didn't work all that well. But if you were in your backyard, a magnet is a huge way to tell that you've got a meteorite because if you find a giant hunk of metal or even a rock with some funny metal flecks in it, if it's a meteorite, it will be magnetic. The iron nickel metal that comes from the meteorites that if it's just an iron meteorite, which is a piece of an asteroid's core, that will be purely magnetic and you'll have a hard time shaking your magnet off. Wow. But the fusion so crust is the big giveaway for if you thought you found something in your yard. Okay. Well, I mean, it could be that all the, all the dog was very decisive and, 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 and left you a little parcel and <laughs> you go around <laughs> celebrating that you found a meteor and the dog has a good laugh. Don't pick that, that up. <laughs> <laughs> so now there the other question some, that... <laughs> yeah, I was going to say there question. are a couple of meteorites from Australia that are actually called camel donga and camel pup donga because that's what they resembled and that's what they thought they were at first. <laughs> that <laughs> is cool. So it wasn't because they were near that particular mound of, yeah. of camel dung, because of course it's all a location-based name. Yeah. <laughs> um, Carl, I want to know, okay, I, I know you mentioned that someone had been hit by a, a meteor, but yeah. from a probability point of view, well, what are the stats uh, when it comes to being struck by a meteorite? Oh, you're going to win the lottery far before you're going to be struck by a meteorite. <laughs> Okay, well, and, and I was hoping to win the last show, so then I don't feel so bad. Yeah, <laughs> your, your chances are now better. <laughs> <laughs> and if you drag the compass around the ground, would that would a, would, would a, a, a meteorite maybe affect the, the way the, the okay. um, compass is pointing? They don't. Some of them have very weak geomagnetic fields or magnetic fields in the metals, but I don't think it would actually affect a compass, no. Not that I've ever heard of anybody trying or or that's happened. But it's okay, worth okay. I'm going to go get one and see. <laughs> there we go. But now here's something interesting. Um, we have a lot of young people, obviously, who watch this. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a lot of people who are streaming it live now uh, through our website. And, and obviously, the people from the Humans to Mars Summit are going to be playing this video continuously during the summit so that young people can, can obviously watch it and engage. What sort of advice would you give young people in terms of either getting into the field or, or to be a little bit more excited about this particular field of study? Right. Whoa, that's a good question. Um, I think, so geology is a field that I didn't appreciate that it is, it encompasses all kinds of other science fields. So you have to do chemistry and you have to do physics and you have to do math, but you also have to do the geology classes. It's got its own lingo, um, all kinds of words that are really geology specific. So. Mm -hmm. And it, and it also involves lots of writing. And one thing you don't think about when you go into science is that there's going to be a lot of public speaking. So there are lots of aspects of science that, that people don't appreciate when you go into it. I thought, oh, I'm going to go sit in the lab all the time. I might not like that. Or, But geology is also, you, if you do terrestrial geology, for example, you can do tons of field work. And we can do you know, studying the Earth, going out into the field and actually studying Earth landforms to try and understand other planets. So... I think for me, getting outside and trying to understand the environment where I was growing up and trying to go and look at other places and, and really understand, you know, once you've looked at some geology and learned a little bit about it, you can take a road trip and, and recognize all kinds of things or take a flight. I and mean, if you look out the window on an airplane, you can see all kinds of folds in the ground and 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 
just studying hard and keeping in mind that you know if you go into a specific field, you're you could end up studying meteorites, and you wouldn't even you know there are there are aspects of a job that you don't know exist when you start trying to study it, and you won't even wow. know that you're interested in before that. So I would say that's that's what ended up happening to me as I found out there was this whole field of science that opened up to me that had I not had I not taken the chance and done this degree that I knew I liked. So there's this phrase, and I heard somebody say it on the radio this morning, you know, if you like what you do, you don't work a day in your life, right? And mm-hmm. and to have a job that you love is super exciting. So if you go and do a topic to study that you actually really like, then you can make it work in lots of well, different I mean, ways. I mean, I, I, I mean, for me, obviously, I'm in that position. I love what I do. I get to meet the most interesting people, and and I get to learn all the time because yeah. I think that's what life should always be about: that constant right. pursuit for knowledge and that yep. that thirst that needs to be quenched. Which uh, I'm always grateful to have experts like you to to provide that service, which is wonderful. Yeah, I'm always happy so, to have people to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carrie, I just want to say thank you very very much for giving up yes. of your time. I know thank that you the wonderful. Me. <laughs> the wonderful team at getkahoot.com have, have put up some space quizzes on their website. No if good. you haven't tried out their, their Kahoot quizzes, I'll put a couple of links um, on the YouTube there uh, where teachers can actually do some great meteorite uh, quizzes and kids no can good. learn about meteorites and actually have fun in class and it's educational and it's free, which is always the best uh, cost for anything. Uh, and of course, Dondi, thank you for sticking out. Uh, Dondi is in Hungary. <laughs> and then we had uh, Joe and, and uh, Jen uh, from the US as well, but we had a whole bunch of viewers from all over the world who were uh, participating, and I've been getting a couple of messages throughout the interview. But thank you so much for yes, giving up you. of your time. And of course, if anything else is exciting happening in the field, if you've discovered yeah. a, a new meteorite, please let us know about it. We'd love to mm-hmm. chat to you about that as well. Okay, and I'll meet you next week in person? Well, I'm mm-hmm. actually not coming to the Human Tomorrow no. Summit. I'm just... I'm part of the technical committee, but okay. uh, I'm doing it through through the internet. The wonderful way of democratizing okay. science means I can share experts like you with yeah. anyone who can't normally afford to get to a, to a summit like that. That's fantastic. Lucky for me, it's just down the street, so I don't have to go oh, anywhere. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to stop the broadcast over here. Okay.